Yeah, yeah I'm mic'd. Why, why do you not hear me? me? I am mic'd. All the mics are on. I was getting levels in OBS, so you should be able to hear me right now. Um, what is... Do you hear me? Text me, dude. Echo. So, so how, how did you get, get rid of the echo, echo before? before? Hey, how'd you get how'd you get, how'd you get rid of the echo before? Oh, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. My, you know what? Honestly, the volume on my computer was up. So, okay, so I did that. Okay, so what's the next thing to check? Phone. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I can hear it. it. I, I heard it just, just, just come through just now. now. So is it, uh, is it good or what? Because I, like, I don't know, like. Okay. Um, I don't know. I know I see that you're playing with all of the the settings on the audio for desktop. And it's really weird to hear myself back and then also talk to you. Yeah, it's, it's good. It's good. Oh, is that what it was? Was it that you needed to be fixed in OBS? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, we've got a couple of minutes before we have to go live, so are you going to um, just make it public? So then you can just cut, I guess you can just pull it out and cut out the beginning. So weird hearing myself back like 30 seconds.
What's up guys? All right, so I guess we're we're going now. So we're all live and everything. We did a, we, me and Marius, we really tried to figure out a whole bunch of new stuff, uh, like a fancy weight screen, music. We've been really trying to figure out this, uh, the streaming thing. So I hope we're doing a pretty good job. Uh, today I thought we would just do a Q&A uh, for a little while. There's a lot of good questions that I've been getting lately. I got a few over email as well. I kind of put out the call for people to answer. And I'll answer questions off the live chat as well. Um, but the first thing that I want to do is we had a super chat cocktail uh, recipe come in. Um, I totally forgot to write the person's name down. So if it's you, please identify yourself. And I don't know what this drink is called. Um, I'm just going to tell you guys the specs right here. It's an ounce of simple syrup, a dash of lime juice, uh, one and a half ounces of beef eater gin, half an ounce of vodka, top it with ginger beer and flute, float, flute, flute. No, float blue curacao. Uh, so that's what we're going to do first. I don't have a name for the cocktail either. Um, it kind of stymies me a little bit because this is an ounce of simple syrup and then a dash of lime juice. But I kind of want to, I think it's like that, that much simple, simple syrup and then top it with ginger beer is going to be a bit, it's going to be a bit much for the ginger beer, I think, um, and the simple syrup together. So, and then just a dash of lime juice. I'm not really sure what that means. So I think I'm just going to respec this uh, the way that I want to do it. So I'm, uh, let's get let's get this started here. So obviously this is going to go into a Collins glass because it is um, it is topped up with ginger beer, which we have right here. We're using Fever Tree tonight. Uh, I was going to do a uh, a, a Scotch uh, highball uh, today. I was going to do a Scotch and soda for the uh, kind of official drink. I think every time I live stream, I'm going to do like one official drink, no matter what we're doing. Even if I'm making cocktails, I'm going to have like my own official drink. But I changed it to a, a gin and tonic, and I'm going to use this lovely Junipero gin that we got in San Francisco when we were up there visiting Nick from Cocktail Chemistry, and we never got to open it. We never actually did anything with it. We used it for a Gin 101 episode we, we, that we haven't actually released, and uh, I want to taste it. Um, I don't know if I've actually ever had Junipero gin either. Uh, I know that it's made by Anchor Distilling, um, and they make some really good stuff, so uh, let's get into it. All right, so... First, let's do this, um, this cocktail. So I think what I'm going to do is a full ounce. I think I'm going to split it. I'm going to do a full ounce of lime juice. And then I'm going to do three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup. Uh, sorry. Yeah, that makes more sense to me. So let's do that. I'm actually squeezing fresh lime, which is technically kind of how you should be doing it anyway. I'll be paying attention to the... Comments in just a second. Marius is manning the comments. So, hello, Marius. Oh, and I just want to tell you guys about my new shirt. Look at this new shirt design. We got this done by a British designer uh, named Oliver Munby. Um, and I will link his um, Instagram below. Uh, but he did a really great, great. So this is a sample that I got. And uh, you can get it on our Teespring. But uh, the sample is... Um, is uh, it's a, like they printed it a little too big and a little too far up, so I need to kind of like move it down and shrink it in a little. But uh, it's our, our it's our uh, holy trinity of cocktails: old fashioned, uh, Manhattan, and a uh, Sazerac. And it's done in a uh, very kind of modern way. I really like it a lot. It's my fun new design. All right, so we do one ounce of uh, lime juice, three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup. <laughs> ounce and a half of beef eater gin. He specifically said beef eater, so I'm going to use it. And luckily, uh, that's all I had in the bottle, one and a half ounces. Uh, and I couldn't find another bottle, so we'll just set that empty bottle off to the side there. Uh, half an ounce of vodka. I'm so we're just taking that vodka to proof it. I don't know if we're not really proofing it up. We're just, I don't know, like we're just kind of thinning it out and putting a little ethanol into it. Uh, cool, I'm going to get some ice. Wah! Wah! Man, I'm just dropping things everywhere today. All right, let's cut this ice down. I like to cut myself little cubes. Nice little... Clear cubes. There we go. Well, let's get some for shaking. All right. 
shake it vigorously over ice double strain it into our glass there we go top it up with the old ginger brew I'm gonna leave a little space at the top because now we're going to float a little blue curacao on top I'm gonna give it a little a little more than a half an ounce I mean sorry a little more than a quarter of an ounce and there it is. Voila. All right. Let's taste this bad boy. Let's see what we're working with here. What's up, Carlos? How was the hangover from the last show? Oh, my. I, I, yeah, I really, I kind of did a little bit of a rookie move. Thanks for bringing it up. It was, uh, it was, it was a little rough the next day, I got to say. It was a little rough. I am not a uh, I am not a young man anymore. So Oh man. Hold please. Hold on a second. Just march. All right, well, it's blue. I mean, it's a little bit sweet with that much simple syrup and ginger beer on top. I say we cut it down to half an ounce, maybe cut the lime down to three quarters of an ounce, and it would be nicely balanced. Just a nice drink. I like it. All right, well, that kind of brings us into our topic for tonight. So I decided we would do a Q&A because I got, honestly... I got this very, 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 very good question. Very long, very well thought out question the, um, the other day about one of the videos that we released, which was the making your own cocktail video. And I thought, you know, a Q&A would be kind of a, a good thing. I don't think I've done one yet. Everybody asked me a lot of questions about cocktails and, and creating cocktails and stuff. And so I thought that we would just kind of start with this. But let's see what Logan has to say. Logan, girlfriend is a wino wants to branch out. Any good wine cocktails I can look up? See you making this evening. Also, uh, where's the the oak silver, the oak silver vodka cocktail? Oh, that's uh, um, the oak sliver vodka cocktail. Yeah, that's the, I will, I will, I, I need to, Logan, I need to taste the oak uh, sliver vodka. And uh, now Marius is calling me. Let's see what he has to say. Hello, Marius. Just fix the focus. Oh, okay, guys, I got to fix the focus. And Marius is unhappy with my focusing skills. Okay, here. All right, hold on. Let's focus. All right, so what should I focus on, my friend? So. How's that? That good? Yeah, we got to double check that. I totally forgot to check that. Okay, yeah? All right, bye. All right, a better image. We had to uh, fix the focus because uh, I kind of forgot to uh, fix the focus. But you know what? Here's the thing. Uh, this is a work in progress, and we are trying to figure out these live streams. There's always something that we forgot. I'm actually digging this drink a lot. Anyway, I got some really good questions. So, Logan, first of all, you want to do a, a really... Here's the gin cocktail that I always make for people who want to branch out and they don't know if they like gin. It's basically an east side. So this is what you do. Two ounces of gin, three quarters uh, lime juice, three quarters simple syrup, takes two cucumber slices and a pinch of mint, muddle it, shake it, double strain it so you don't get all the mint pieces in your cocktail into a chilled coupe. Uh, garnish with a mint leaf, slap that mint leaf, leaf a little bit to release the oils and that is a winning cocktail. She will love it and she will love you for it. Uh, the oak sliver, uh, vodka is going to take me a little second to get to, uh, but I will get to it. I need to taste it and figure out what it, it's got to go through. It's got to go to, to, into something that's stirred. 
uh, I think. It's got to, because if not, you're going to lose the kind of nuance of the flavor. I have my, um, just so Marius uh, knows, I got my phone. I'm, ch- I'm going to look at my texts as we go, just in case there's something else I forgot. Uh, how do you modify the Cointreau tequila lime margarita better? What I make at home is just not as good. Um, Cointreau tequila lime. So that, that margarita, basically what I do is I do one ounce of lime juice. You want it nice and, and tart. Uh, half an ounce of dry curacao. I do half an ounce of agave syrup to kind of sweeten it up just a little bit. And then two ounces of uh, tequila. Shake it, strain it. If you want to add uh, salt, I actually like to put a little, a couple of saline drops into it as opposed to uh, rimming it with salt. Because the saline, right, saline drop salt is going to really, really bring the flavors out a lot more. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. Okay. So I don't know this, this person super chatted and they made this cocktail. I just want to talk through it really quick. Uh, I think I might've a second ago, but I, I, I want them to really get their, their super chats worth. So, uh, this is really nice. I think it's a little bit sweet with a simple syrup, but it's nice. I think I would dial back the lime at half an ounce, no quarter of an ounce to three quarters of an ounce. I dial back the, uh, simple syrup, a quarter of an ounce to half an ounce. Uh, so three quarter half. Uh, and then I do probably just two ounces of gin, get rid of the vodka because there's no reason for it to be in there. Uh, ginger beer and the blue curse out. It's really nice. Yeah, it's good. Good drink. What are we calling this though? If you are here, please let me know. Uh, okay, cool. So the other thing that we're going to do is we're going to get to these uh, questions. I want to read this question because it's a really long, long, long question. He made a lot of really good points in this and I kind of want to answer them point by point. Uh, so let me bring up the... Uh, YouTube, the old YouTube. Here we go. So the guy's name is Ocean Green, and he was leaving this on the uh, How to Create Your Own Cocktails video that we released a couple of days ago. Uh, and basically, he said, I love this is going to be long, guys. Okay, I'm just looking at this. This is going to be kind of a long, this is very well thought out. I got to do this point by point. It's going to take me a little bit of a second, so forgive me if I'm not looking at the chat right now. Uh, thank you, Eric, for the super chat, by the way. Uh, so he says, I love what you're doing. I love that you're doing explainers about how to invent cocktails, but I feel like this one fell a bit short on explaining exactly how and why of the example drink, aside from the discussion of the main spirits in the end. I'll just preface what follows with one, I know Leandro is a skilled professional bartender. Two, I am neither of those things, just an enthusiastic amateur. Okay. Thank you, and thanks for admitting it. Three, I know the recipe, uh, as demonstrated, probably works well. And four, opinions are like a-holes, and I definitely have both. Thank you for that, because that's always what I... Anytime anyone leaves a comment, that's what I think. Um, That said, as someone who has given a lot of thought to how to teach people not just how to make cocktails from a recipe, but actually how to invent cocktail recipes, since I've yet to find really good content on that, these are my concerns. Okay, fair enough. Let's see. Oh, Oh, Sean Green, you're here. Surely you don't want to read the whole thing. No, no, I, it's pronounced ocean. Oh, ocean. I love that. That's a beautiful name, man, by the way. Uh, but it's not an intuitive spelling. Uh, thanks to my parents. I like it. Ocean is a, is a, that's a, that's awesome. I love that. It's a great name. Uh, I am going to read the whole thing and I'm going to go through this comment point by point. A, I was really impressed by the comment and B, it was so well thought out and asked such good questions. I thought that it would be a benefit to all of us to sort of kind of pick through this and pick it apart. Unpack it, if you will. So he said, you spend the first third of the video talking about cocktail identity in fairly clear and specific terms, e.g. an old fashioned should be two ounces of spirit, roughly 0.25 ounces of sweetener and a bitter component. The problem is a Caipirinha doesn't have aperitivo or any bittering component besides citrus peel it, uh, in it at all to begin with. So right away you're breaking with the templated approach that you described earlier in the video. Obviously there's nothing wrong with substituting it here uh, for half of the primary spirit if you know what you're doing, and I trust that it works, but at the same time, it would not be the most intuitive modification for me for a couple of reasons. Okay, so first of all, I just want to say that even though I gave that example of the old fashioned, that example for the old fashioned is a very clear, specific example for someone to sort of easily wrap their head around the idea of substitution. Two ounces of spirit. That being said, you don't always have to have such a uh, literal approach when you use something as an inspiration. So for instance, in that, in basically what a caipirinha is, is, mud, is, a, is a teaspoon of sugar 
with muddled uh, lime, right? Two ounces of spirit, and then you uh, and then you uh, you like you know whip shake that, dump it into a, a glass, and then put crushed ice on top of that. As I know, as as I have been uh, uh, taught, what a, that is what a caipirinha is. And so basically, what I did is just modified the main spirit by taking out the what uh, usually it's cachaça, right? So I took out the cachaça and I put an aperitivo in there because I thought that the bitterness of the aperitivo were gonna go really well with the sweetness of the sugar mixed with the lime juice. But also when you muddle peels, when you muddle the peels of lime, you get a little bit of the bitterness, bitterness of the pith and you get the oil from the skin. So you get this really, what I like to call three-dimensionally lime flavor. It's just so intensely lime uh, and there's really nothing like it. And so I was basically pairing the aperitivo bitterness and sweetness uh, with, the, uh, with the, uh, the, the actual muddled peel of lime. Okay, first, as you noted, subbing out fully half of the primary spirit for an aperitivo, and in this case, a much lower ABV one, which can definitely wind up creating a more flat cocktail. Cachaca in, in a typical caipirinha is like most base spirits at 40%, whereas your aperitivo is just shy of 18%. That's true. Uh, so aperitivos are gonna be uh, lower in alcohol. That's why I actually split it with mezcal. So two reasons why I put mezcal in there. First reason why I put mezcal in there is because I wanted the smoke from the mezcal, but I didn't wanna choose a mezcal that had too much smoke. I wanted something with citrus elements that are gonna go well with that aperitivo and go well with the limes that I put in there. So that's also, but the thing is, is that also the, uh, the uh, it is gonna be a lower ABV cocktail than just doing two ounces of cachaca, but at the same time, I proofed it up a little bit with that mezcal as well. So we're adding it for its flavor properties, but we're also adding it to proof it up a little bit. And then you have your aperitivo in there as well. So then what we're doing is we have this like nice and smoky, kind of sharply citrus, a little lightly sweet, and then you have uh, the aperitivo. Now, the other thing that you mentioned in here at some point is that, the aperitivo does have a healthy amount of sugar in it, but I played with the sugar in a very specific way, and you ask about that, and I didn't explain it in the video, all right? So um, the thing is, is that the mezcal is also gonna make sure that you don't have too flat of a cocktail. It's going to add character to it, and it's gonna punch it up a little bit as well in the flavor, um, in the flavor kind of arena. I need a sip. Second, and perhaps more importantly, unlike most base spirits, aperitivos are an incredibly flavorable ingredient. And so when you substitute it for a full half of the base spirit, I start to wonder about the balance of the cocktail identity at that point. This is arguably closer to a variation of an Italian gentleman, but here's the thing. You start to reference a drink called an Italian gentleman, which is absolutely just a riff on another cocktail. You know, as, we, as I mentioned in this five, the seven, or the six famous cocktails video that I did, is that there are basically six templates for cocktails and everything else, every, the multitude of cocktails come out of those six templates, basically. Um, you know, and a, and a caipirinha is basically a sour. So, uh, substituting muddled citrus for squeezed that is in a caipirinha, of course you said yourself the caipirinha is basically a sour variation in and of itself, so I'll grant you that there is wiggle room. But why does identity matter? Well, if you're trying to teach someone about how to exist, uh, adapt an existing recipe, uh, presumably that's helpful because the existing recipe is both known to work and, and familiar to the person experimenting. What you've done here, though, is depart radically from the recipe that inspired you. So the thing is, is that what, like, what I think you're doing here is that you're thinking about this a little bit too literally. Um, the point is to depart. But all I did, literally all I did was change the main spirit and then split the base, right? So I did what, an ounce and a half of the aperitivo and I did half an ounce of the mezcal, right? So I split the base, but I only changed the base spirit. Everything else about the cocktail is 100% the same as a caipirinha. All I did was split the base and, that, and, and it shows you how radically different something can be, how much of a different cocktail something can be by just changing the base spirit. Uh, so, that's how I would kind of answer that. Third, with a lower ABV aperitivo, you're adding a lot of additional sugar. But, not, but here's the thing, and this is gonna answer two questions that you had. So what I did with the, with the sugar was I added a little bar spoon of sugar in there, and then I also added a half an ounce of simple syrup. And what that do, does is this. The half an ounce of syrup 
serves to immediately start to balance the lime. But basically when you put muddle, well like usually I would put a sugar cube in there, but when you put that, that bar spoon of sugar in there and then muddle it, you basically have the sweetness on a time release. So what happens is, is that I wanted to put three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup, let's say. That's the, the equivalent of sugar that I put into the cocktail was three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup, right? But I split it by doing half an ounce of actual simple syrup that's gonna mix immediately, right? When I whip shake it. And then I put uh, that bar spoon of, of granulated sugar in there, which is not going to fully dilute. And so what happens is, is that as the ice melts, the sugar dissolves further and it gets a little sweeter and a little sweeter and that helps to do two things. A, it helps to uh, continue that three-dimensional kind of lime flavor, but it also helps to kind of offset the water from the dilution from the crushed ice, right? So you kind of have its sweetness throughout. And then thirdly, what I like to say about old fashions kind of applies here as well, which is like, what happens when you drink a mouthful of sugar? So you drink your cocktail, you sip your cocktail through your crushed ice and at the very end you get the sweet pop at the end and then what do you think happens? What happens is, is that you get a mouthful of sugar, just a little bit, and then your dopamine releases and you get really happy and that kind of leads you to your next cocktail. Uh, that's kind of the thought behind that. Um, now please understand, I love it when things defy my expectations in a cocktail, so all of this is ultimately a good thing if it works, but as far as a good and well-explained example for for people of how to adapt existing recipes, to me it feels a little more challenging and unintuitive than it needs to be. I also think you could explain your thinking behind the choice of primary spirit and aperitivo or other ingredient a bit better. You covered it a bit in the tasting. So basically this is what I did. I really wanted to use the select because the select is kind of halfway between Aperol and Campari. I wanted it to be uh, more bitter than Aperol would be with a little bit less sugar than Aperol would be, but I didn't want to go for the full bitterness of Campari and select Aperitivo is right in the middle there. But the thing is, is that the whole point of this cocktail was to make basically a sour variation where we take the bitterness of the Aperitivo and we, and we kind of, kind of mat, like we, we sort of like pair it in, right? With the bitterness that we're going to get from the lime pith and the oil from the lime peel, and that was kind of the whole, the whole point of it. We did the, the bar spoon of sugar to sort of put it on a time release so that it wouldn't be too sweet too fast, especially because we're accounting for a little bit of sugar inside the aperitivo as well. All right, what else we got here? Uh, I'll grant that this may be nitpicky, and you almost say things already in different ways for different parts of the video, but I do think clarity matters in educational content and when you're trying to teach someone how to be creative, showing the forethought and planning is the point, not just the end result and that it works. Arguably, not just, I, I hey listen Ocean, I really appreciate this comment a lot and obviously my videos are a, they are a work in progress and uh, I'm gonna use this to kind of, you know, here's the thing is that I, I decided that I wanted to do three or four different videos. I'll get to you Landon Jones. Uh, three or four different videos on um, how to build cocktails in, in sort of similar but different ways and how to start, start thinking about creating your own. This was the first. I'm glad that you had such a well thought out uh, question because it's going to help me dial in these videos further. And that's what I really like. I really like, like really well thought out constructive criticism that I can kind of build on to make the videos better. So I really thank you very much. I hope I answered some of it in a clear way. Um, that was my thinking behind the video, and I hope that you like the answer, I guess. I don't know. Uh, all right, I'm going to get to what, I'm going to have to scroll up to see what Landon Jones said. Hey, Leandro, thanks for the q and I've always struggled with the taste of whiskey. Do you have any recommendations and or cocktails that I would use to acclimate myself? Landon Jones, can you please, uh, like what whiskey are we talking about here? Are we talking about, like I need clarity. Are we talking about scotch? Are we talking about American whiskey, rye, corn whiskey? Uh, what are we talking about here? I am looking at the comments. Just let me know. Lana Jones, okay. True, Jack and Coke is a gateway for sure. I had a few buckets of them in the Thailand. Here's the thing is that I think that a lot of things when it comes to spirits tasting is, you know, an acquired taste. And sometimes you have to examine like the idea of like why you want to drink the things that you want to drink. But you know, you will acquire a taste for them if you want to, you know. Uh, whiskey is not something that is, uh, you know, straight, wonderful off the bat for everybody. Uh, but if you do acquire a taste for it, uh, you will start to then be able to pick apart all of those nuanced flavors and it is incredibly enjoyable. 
The first Negroni I had, I almost spit it out, I got to tell you. I didn't like Negronis for a really long time. Being in the bartending world for as long as I am, I, I have been though, I've been exposed to Campari a lot. I acquired a taste for Campari over time and now Negronis are next to heaven for me. So uh, there's that. I'm going to go to some email questions because some people emailed me some questions earlier today. Uh, all right, let's see what we got here. Ooh, lots of new. I don't, for some reason, there's a fly in the in the house now. Bar fly. All right, here we go. Let's see. All right, from Melrose Mixtures. Hi, I'm Mel. I've worked in the hospitality industry for eight years now, and my biggest battle I've found is dealing with either rude or passive-aggressive customers. Would you be able to give a few examples how you deal with these situations at goals? Any tips in doing so? My example, clicking, waving, slapping uh, at the bar top, customer at the bar saying that they, want ne they were next in line. Okay, so there's a couple of different ways that I deal with rude customers, but what I try to do is kill people with kindness. And usually you can turn them around. That's the first kind of thing that you want to do. So it sucks having to be the bigger person most of the time. Um, but I will say this is that if somebody is doing something really aggressive to you and you uh, respond aggressively, it's going to uh, escalate the situation and it could get ugly pretty quickly, especially when people have been drinking and they're not really, they're not really thinking very clearly uh, or being very logical. So really what I try to do is kind of try to kill them with kindness first and see what happens. Sometimes people just wanna have a fight with somebody, they had a bad day. You know, I also try to take into consideration that everybody that you see is fighting a battle that is invisible to you. Uh, you don't know what they're going through. They could have a sick mother or a sick, you know, husband or wife or something and, uh, or they could be going through a loss of a job or some really, something really heavy. Um, and so they're kind of looking for someone to sort of take their aggression out on. So being the bartender, right, is someone who's being the hospitable person and also trying to, you know, somewhat of a dime store th psychologist, really. And really what you want to do is you want to try and de-escalate the situation. There are some people who are just rude. They're just being a douchebag in your bar and that's really difficult. Um, I kind of do, I kind of deal with those on a case by case basis, really, you know? Um, and it just really depends. I mean, sometimes I'll have to get management to step in. Uh, to remove somebody. Sometimes I'll have security remove somebody. Uh, sometimes I can do, deal with it on my own. Sometimes I've gotten to the point where I've called them out in front of people. Doesn't always go well. Don't recommend it. Sometimes it's a necessary step. Um, but the thing is, is that at the end of the day, you're the bartender, you're in control of your domain, and uh, you can 86 someone that's making you feel uncomfortable if you want, and then hopefully you have the management or security support, or management and security support at your job to help you kind of deal with the situation. But that's really what I do. Usually I try and take the high road, is what I'm trying to say, I guess. Uh, all right, next question. Anyone else got a question on chat? Let's see. Let's take a look. Draven. Uh, oh, Draven was asking about the... Cool. I love how bartender stream is now. This. <laughs> Marius is scrolling up, but I don't know why. Have you ever had Knob Creek smoked maple whiskey? And do you know any good cocktails for it or good uses? Okay. Uh, I have not had uh, Knob Creek uh, maple smoked whiskey, so I'm not really sure what it tastes like. Um, a good, just sort of like, a, just like a good tester for whiskeys is how, how does it make an old, like, it doesn't make a good old fashioned. If you can make a good old fashioned with it, you know, I mean, it's like maple smoked whiskey means that they're probably using like a smoked maple wood in the production somehow, or I don't know, filtering it through smoked maple wood maybe. I'm, I'm not uh, familiar with that particular uh, whiskey. I haven't tasted it, so I don't really know. Um, and I would have to taste it to really give you recommendations on cocktails, but I always start with the old fashioned. Can this thing make a good old fashioned? Elijah Cox, hey, Leandro, made a great drink last night using homemade grapefruit orange sorbet. I love it. Roku gin, one of my favorites, topped with soda, water. Yes. Have you ever heard or have seen this done? I mean, I've seen uh, gin and sorbet cocktails topped with soda before. 
Uh, didn't have to use simple syrup because the sorbet was probably sweet enough. Uh, no, I, I mean, no, that I mean, I haven't seen that specific thing done yet, Elijah. But I have seen uh, sorbet utilized in gin cocktails before, and it sounds phenomenal. That's awesome. I, how did it turn? I'm sure it turned out fantastic. Just finished the yellow pepper number two cocktail and thought it was an infused vodka drink, but just mezcal, yellow chartreuse, and. Uh, Is it a question though, Nicolas? Wait, just finished the yellow pepper number two cocktail. I thought it was a, a infused vodka drink, but just mezcal, yellow chartreuse, and citrus and pepper. Yeah, that's what it is. Ah, oh, I really struggle with aperitivos, I know. Well, you know, it's, that's the thing. It's not, it's not for everybody. Let's scroll down. Mary says, Leandro, I need a wine cocktail. Ooh, kitty highball. That's what you want to do. You want to do a kitty highball. Wait, hold on. Let's, let's look at that wine cocktail super chat, Marius. Come on. Let's go back up, back up. Oh, what are you doing? What you doing? There we go. Leon, so wine cocktail, recommendation, please. This is gonna change your life, okay? This is what you do. And you can do it with oxidized wine if you have like a bottle of wine that's been sitting around for a day or so. Nothing that's turned to vinegar. It's turned to vinegar, throw it out or make vinegar out of it. Or just keep it vinegar. Make Use it for cooking. I don't know. Uh, so there's this thing called a kitty highball. Uh, it is a fantastic drink. Uh, it's an old school drink, but the specs I'm going to give you are reconstructed from some bar, I think in New York. I can't remember which one. Forgive me. But this is what you do. Uh, it's basically you make it into a buck. So you do uh, three, you do half an ounce of uh, lime juice, three quarters of an ounce of fresh ginger syrup, two ounces of uh, wine. Shake it. I'm assuming we mean red wine though. So shake it, strain it, uh, ice, uh, soda water on top. It's a winner. It's called a kitty. Kitty highball, Logan. You're gonna love that. Thank you for these live streams. The autumn in Jersey cocktail that you made has opened my eyes to the use of layers. Looking for more apple brandy cocktails. Well, I think we have a, um, I think we have a, uh, we must have a playlist. We must have a playlist. And I can't rattle off every single one, but you, there's two cocktails I'll give you specs for right now. Uh, with layers that is that are amazing. So the first one would be a, an American trilogy, which is like uh, four dashes of orange bitters, one cube of demerara sugar muddled, a little dash of soda water, muddle that up, one ounce of Rittenhouse rye, hundred proof, one ounce of hundred proof Laird's uh, bonded applejack, big rock of ice, orange twist, and then the other one is a Jack Rose. So you want to do three quarters of an ounce of lime juice, three quarters of an ounce of uh, Grenadine, and then two ounces of the 100 proof Laird's Applejack. Shake it, strain it into a cocktail, into a coupe, into a chilled coupe with a lime uh, wheel. There you got it. Okay, here we go. Esteban. Hello from Costa Rica. Well, hello from Los Angeles. What is your, opi what is your opinion on infusing spirits with N2O nit nitrous, whip nitrous whipper? Do you have any recommendations on what to infuse? Thank you. Yes, I have lots of things. Uh, I have lots of, uh, lots of opinions on what to infuse. Um, uh, that is a really, really good technique for, uh, for rapid infusion. That's what we call it, right? When you take the Issy Whipper and some NO2, uh, and, uh, you could do like turmeric vodka, or you could do, uh, any type of botanical into gin. If you want to like make that gin taste a s specific way, really herbs are the best thing to infuse and whatever herb you do, just pick a spirit that's going to go really well with it. And get crazy and try and do something like cachaça with, you know, some, some herb or like cachaça and basil might go really well together. So, you know, pick things that you think would go really well. Uh, it's a really good rapid infusion technique and I like it a lot. Uh, hi, Leandro. Uh, where, this is from Uwak23. What are your work, our workhorse Amaros when making cocktails? What are the must-haves? Good question. And I will be doing an Amaro roundup at some point, a video that just goes through the history and then like what bottles you need to have. Uh, workhorse bottles include, okay, like my dyed in the wool, die hard workhorse bottles are Aperol, Campari, Chinar, uh, Averna, uh, Fernet Branca, Amaro Nonino, uh, Yellow Chartreuse, Green Chartreuse, which aren't Amaro, Amari, but they are must haves in the liqueur, in the French liqueur. You need to have those. Those are like the uh, Genepi de Alps. I really like a lot. Although a lot of people say that's just like that's just like poor man's. I don't know green chartreuse. Um, I like to have a bottle of Chinar 70 on hand. Uh, uh, Branca Menta 
is another one that I like to have on hand. Um, and then these aren't Amari, but like in your like aperitivo, like I already said some aperitivos, but then like in your aperitivo, like wine-based aperitivo vermouth sections, you need to have obviously like, I like Dolan Blanc. I like to have a bottle of um, Dolan Sweet, Via Sweet. And then I also really like to have a bottle of Carpano Antica on hand. I like the Antica Bianco on hand as well. And then I also like to have um, uh, uh, Dolan Dry as well. And then Cokie Americano and Cokie Rosa. Uh, I also always usually have a bottle of Lillet on hand as well. Like Lillet, Lillet Blanc. Um, so I think those would be my workhorse ones. All right, here we go. It's 7 p.m. PST is going to be a normal time from now on in the streams. Well, here's the deal. The reason why I do them at 7 p.m. is because um, right now, because of coronavirus, my kids are home. And they're, they're basically, they're not really like, you know, they're kind of homeschooling basically. And so what I try to do is I try to do the streams right around their bedtime so that I can be uninterrupted with the streams. That being said, I, I will plan uh, to do a couple of streams um, earlier in the day. So I tried one at three o'clock a little while ago. I was a little bit of a mess. We have a pretty big uh, setup that goes on here. I have a very, very, very inquisitive uh, five-year-old that loves to kind of get in the equipment and ask me what I'm doing and whatever. So there's that. Um, but I will try and do a little bit earlier because there's some people in Europe that it's just like, it's like too late for them to watch and it's too early for their morning commute. Uh, they have to watch it after the fact. Um, so I'm going to try. But 7 p.m. is pretty much the money spot for me. Uh, and uh, the way that the family's running right now. So yeah, that's what I'm going to do at, for now anyway. Goddess Astrola, what a, what a name. Okay, could you give me an opinion on, or suggestion for improvement on a drink I created? One ounce lemon cello, two ounces vodka, four ounces apple juice can be sparkling, lots of ice and garnish with cherries and orange. I'd love to give you an opinion on this, but I cannot for the life of me Imagine what limoncello and apple juice, they sound like they could be amazingly good or really bad. And I can't figure that out. Here's the thing, Goddess Astrola. I'm going to have to, I have some limoncello, but I don't have apple juice right now. I don't have it in me to pull out the juicer on the live stream and juice apple juice and then do it. So give me a couple of, give me a day or two and I'll get back to you. Why don't you email me at theeducatedbarfly at gmail.com. Email me so that I have a, a way to get back to you and I will get back to you on this and I'll give you my honest opinion. It's going to have to be after the fact, I think. All right. Evan F., you could be like Greg from How to Drink and use your kids to make non-alcoholic drinks. At the Educated Blood Fire, is there such a thing as a, verm as a vermouth fridge? Do I want to be that guy? Yes. Well, first of all, why would I want to be like Greg when Greg can be like Greg and I'll be like myself? But... Uh, why don't you just get a wine fridge? A wine fridge is the same thing as a vermouth fridge. You want to keep them at about the same temperature anyway. So just get a wine fridge. And yes, you definitely want to be that guy. I'm that guy. And you want it. Don't you want to kind of be like me? I think you do. I'm awesome. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Any Ray and Nephew overproof suggestions out there that won't overpower the drink? Yes, I actually have one that's my own cocktail called an Old Salt which is uh, three quarters of an ounce of lime juice, three quarters of an ounce of honey syrup, one and a half ounces of Ray and Nephew Overproof, and half an ounce of yellow chartreuse. Shake it, strain it, pinch of salt. Awesome cocktail. Two ounce tequila, one ounce lime, one ounce tomato juice, dash of Worcestershire. It sounds like a tequila. It sounds like a, uh, a Bloody Maria. Recommendations for Canadian whiskey cocktails. I have a bottle of Crown Royal just sitting around that I would like to put to productive use. Well, I will say this, that you can probably sub out most rye whiskey cocktails with Canadian whiskey because if Canadian whiskey isn't, high, it's not 100 proof rye, it's high in rye content. Uh, so you would be able to sub out most rye cocktails with any Canadian whiskey, I would think. Uh, it's been a while since I had any Crown Royal to my dome, but uh, I'm not against it. I just haven't had a bottle in a while. Um, but yeah, I think like most rye cocktails you could probably do that with. I had a cocktail with some lemon juice and apple juice and for it to go really well, use less lemon flavor and then and flavor than apple flavor. Okay, that makes sense, I guess. All right, Marius, you guys missed Billy Shears, Billy Shears super chat. Oh. 
Can we go back up to Billy Shear's super chat? Cool. I'm actually going to get to a question from email because I had a couple of more. All right. What do we got here? Gwen, what advice do you have for upcoming bartenders in developing countries? What have been some challenges you have faced? How do you choose your content for your videos and what do you enjoy about bartending? Oh, okay. Oh, these are all really good questions. So, uh, advice, I don't, I'm not sure what advice that I would have for bartenders in developing countries more so than just like, what, what do I, what advice do I have for bartenders in general? And what I would say is find my one big thing is once you have gotten yourself. So once you have gotten yourself behind the bar and you are officially a bartender, you are no longer a bar back. I think that you should go out of your way to find a really good um, uh, uh, mentor. You need someone to mentor you. So I was really fortunate to land inside a bar where somebody could teach me the basis of everything that I know. And even though I learned a lot on my own, I, I have sought out people that I have wanted to work with over the lifetime of my career to really, uh, you know, kind of develop my skill set. Now, I did this, I found people that were that could teach me things that I wanted to learn. So for instance, this is a good example is my really good friend Gabby Mwarchik was running uh, the bar program inside a fine dining establishment in Hollywood. Uh, I took a look at her cocktails. I found out that she was hiring. I took a look at her cocktails. I, she was doing a lot of these like, you know, kind of very chef driven style cocktails, utilizing a lot of kitchen technique. Um, this is something that I knew I, I needed to know because my basis was mainly in classics. And so I sought out the uh, mentorship from her and I learned so much about using a sous vide, about fat washing, rapid infusions, a lot of that stuff I learned from Gabby. Um, and she was working with a chef where a lot of the cocktails were paired with what was on the menu. Everything was rotating seasonally. Um, she was using, you know, I like to call these farmer's market cocktails because a lot of the stuff was fresh local farmer's market pulls um, or, you know, going to very specific grocery stores to get specific things like going to the Japanese grocery store to get shiso leaves and other kind of fresh ingredients for certain flavor profiles. So I would say get yourself a mentor. Um, I, uh, as far as challenges that I faced, you know, I don't know what challenges I've faced. You know, I, I think that getting behind the bar every single day is a challenge. And, you know, I think, you know, some of the challenges that I've had behind the bar are, you know, really putting my game face on if I'm, you know, having a bad day or, or something personal is going on and really uh, trying to give like exceptional service to people. Uh, obviously dealing with unruly customers are kind of a challenge sometime. And I've had management challenges at times as well. And uh, I think all of these things are just things that I've learned to sort of deal with and kind of roll through, you know, just with a keeping that kind of ideal of what I wanted my career to be uh, in front of me. Uh, and then how do you choose your content? Well, I choose the content that I think that people, sh I mean, you know, what differentiates the educated barfly from a lot of channels, Billy Shears, I saw your super chat and I will get back to you in just a second. Um, but uh, I think what differentiates the Educated Barfly from a lot of different channels is that it's mainly educational based. It's not just entertainment. I try to be entertaining. Marius and I definitely try to be entertaining and I hope you guys are entertained. But at the same time, what we're doing is, you know, the whole idea of this channel when we began was I wanted to teach people that they could make professional quality drinks at home and I wanted to teach the technique behind doing it because I think that everybody should be able to make a good drink, really. And I knew that there was a market out there for people who really wanted to know this stuff. Uh, and that's what my channel is kind of based on. So I sort of, ba I kind of choose the content that I think people will learn the most from. Now, I wouldn't, I would be a liar if I said I didn't try to optimize it for views and I try to pick things that I think a lot of people will watch, but a lot of it is just picked for um, is just picked for the educational sort of content. And I've tried to sort of build my channel on a 
somewhat of a narrative, you know, like uh, we did a lot of classic cocktails before and I, I tried to teach all the basics of classic cocktails and then all the modern classics that everyone should know once they had those classic cocktails down. And now we're sort of getting into some more advanced stuff like fat washing and rapid infusions and foams and things. And I just kind of hope that people are sort of watching all of the videos uh, that we offer because I know that on YouTube, a lot of people just want to watch the freshest, latest video. But there's a lot of content out there that, uh, that we put out over the last two years. I sort of tried to build it on a timeline, even though not many people knew that. And you can just go sort of pick and choose based on your level and what you want to know, what you want to watch. All right, Billy Shears. Hi, Leandro. Love the flavor of Mr. Black, but it seems to overpower any cocktail I put, put it in. Is there another coffee liqueur you can recommend? Well, I would say this, Mr. Billy Shears. Mr. Black is... Of it's actual real coffee mixed with vodka and it is a phenomenal product. It's not overly sweet, which is what I like about it. Uh, and I, I would say that instead of changing the coffee liqueur, you might want to try and just dial your specs down a little bit and sort of, you know, the thing is, is that there are certain flavors that any coffee liqueur is going to run over because those flavors are too delicate. So you got to make sure that you're picking um, ingredients that are sort of complementary to that coffee, but... If you must know, I do like to drink myself a little bit of, oh, excuse me, I'm a little burpy there and I haven't finished my cocktail. Uh, I do like to drink uh, Cafe Lolita on occasion. To, to me, that's a little bit sweeter. It's a little bit sweeter than Mr. Black. I haven't used Cafe Lolita in a long time. I've actually used Mr. Black for most cocktails. Uh, but um, Cafe Lolita is a pretty good one. And then also uh, uh, St. George Spirits makes a Nola coffee liqueur that's really, really good as well. So you should try that. But all coffee liqueurs that are made well are going to be very, they're going to be very powerful. So just make sure that you are picking complementary ingredients. We are entertained. For those that make their own cider, what cocktails would you make with it? Well, you got to make a stone fence. You definitely have to make a stone fence if you're making your own cider. Uh, and then also, I like to pair cider with tequila a lot. So you do like tequila, like I had this drink a couple of, a little while ago, it was like tequila, I'm just remembering off the top of my head, I don't have the specs in front of me, it was a while ago, but it was like tequila, uh, I pay, we have this prickly pear liqueur made by Ventura Spirits called uh, Opuntia that I really like a lot, uh, with a little lemon juice, uh, pineapple gum syrup, uh, and then uh, topped with, uh, we did like a hibiscus cider on top of that, it was really nice, I really liked it a lot. Um, but uh, I like to pair it with tequila. I like to pair it with gin quite a bit, depending on what kind of cider it is. Uh, but you should pick out a. St you should definitely do a stone fence. That's a great cocktail. Uh, my girlfriend doesn't think this is really live. Can you say Jessica out loud so she just knows it is? Uh, Jessica out loud. Do you now believe that this actually is live? All right. What else we got here? Can you greet me? Yes, Guillermo Gaber, Gebauer. Uh, hello, greetings. Greetings, Guillermo. Thanks, Leandro. Uh, no problem, brother. Uh, Leandro, did you read the article from The Guardian I've sent to you on Twitter? I don't know. Honestly, dude, Jose, can you send it to my email? Because to tell you the honest to God truth, I ignore Twitter. I don't really do Twitter. Uh, we don't have very many followers. I never post on there. I never look at it. I never open it up in, in, in my iPhone or whatever. So uh, theeducatedbarfly at gmail.com. Please send it to me there and I'll absolutely read the article for sure. Super interested. So just send it, send it to somewhere other than Twitter, <laughs> I guess. Uh, what's your favorite Cuban cocktail? Uh, I don't know if I have a favorite Cuban cocktail, but I do like myself a mojito and I make a pretty mean one, so... Uh, have you tried it? And I like a daiquiri too, which is, you know, technically it could be considered a Cuban cocktail. Dan Norwood, thank you for the super chat. He didn't ask any questions though. Tony, have you tried using monk fruit sweetener before in cocktails? I have, well, I've tried using monk fruit sweetener and I just don't, I can't, it has an aspartame sort of flavor to it, which really makes it taste like diet soda. Every, everything you put in there makes it taste like diet. And so I, I don't like it. So uh, I've tried it. I, I haven't really been able to do anything much with it though. Uh, if you had to impress one someone, what would you serve? Oh, anytime I want to impress anybody, I usually pick something that's visually stunning. And I try to sort of read the person 
you know, kind of based on that. So like, so usually I'll go for a uh, Queen's Park Swizzle, which is basically, it's just one ounce of lime, three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup, two ounces of rum. If you want to be really pedantic about it, you can use Demerara rum, which is the original cocktail was used, but you can use any type of rum you want. You basically shake it, you strain it into a glass, you do crushed ice, and then you add Angostura bitters, and it creates a little level of Angostura bitters on it, and then you add crushed ice to the top of it, so you have this like cocktail, and then this, this like Angostura bitters ice, and then a nice snow cap on it with a big mint sprig. It wows every single time. All right, here we go. Treasure Wuji. I assume for developing country bartender, even the normal bottles costs. So find a high-end bar with a training program is the best to seek affordable substitutes uh, is good if you want to branch out. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's true. I mean, the thing is, is that I've not been, I mean, every developing country is going to be different and I'm assuming that everywhere is going to have some high-end bar that you want to go to. But to tell you the honest to God truth, where you are might not have bars that are, that are teaching uh, the technique that you want to know. And so, for instance, a channel like The Educated Barfly or How to Drink or Steve the Bartender, they're teaching you things that you actually might be able to upgrade your knowledge past the high-end bar that's available to you. And you could very easily be by just seeking the knowledge out on your own, seeking the books out and ordering them um, over the internet if you can do that. Um, is really going to put you maybe even uh, ahead of people. That being said, I think that you know, also, you know, working with what you have and finding a mentor within your community and working with them, right, can really help you sort of tap into your uh, place because every country has its own customs and its own culture and you obviously are working within that and so you're going to have to tap into that as well. Uh, I don't, hope that wasn't too roundabout. Uh, I've been adapting Tipsy Bartender's Giant's Milk has Kahlua, Bailey's Fireball, Godiva, white chocolate, Hennessy, and milk, roughly equal parts. Any ideas on how to improve? It's a mind obliterator, LOL. So yes, I would try and switch out the Baileys. I would try and switch out the Kahlua. Uh, the Godiva white chocolate might have to stay unless you, oh, unless you wanna do a, I'd basically make my own fireball, right? By make, making like an, an infused, can you go back up to that, Marius, please? Um, an infused uh, cinnamon whiskey. You could basically infuse whiskey with cinnamon, kind of make your own fireball. Uh, I would use uh, another type of Irish cream, maybe like a Carolyn's Irish cream, which is a little bit, a little bit more to my taste than something like Bailey's would be. The Kahlua you could make, uh, you could find like a nice cold brew, either cold brew spiked cold brew coffee, or you could find a cold brew uh, coffee liqueur like uh, Mr. Black or something. Um, and then uh, the, for the white chocolate, you could fat wash white chocolate into a spirit and sort of do it that way. Lots of uh, improvement, though. That's the thing. Uh, you'd have to... That, the thing is... not. I said lots of improvement. What I meant was lots of experimentation. That is a monster of a drink. Uh, reconstructing it would take a very long time and a lot of testing. So you, uh, but there is somewhere where I would go with that. Okay. What do we got? What do we got? Tony, I've tried monk fruit too, and it's... Uh, and agree it's rough to work with. Is there any value to getting a certificate like certified spirit special or spirit sommelier if you're looking to get into the spirits industry? Um, no, I don't think so. Every There's not one person that I've ever run into that has ever gotten any type of certification. Pretty much, mo there's only one sort of bar smart certification that is run by kind of leaders in the industry like David Wondrich and Dale DeGroff that are worth your time at all. Uh, they do an online certification for 40 bucks called Bar Smarts Wired. And then they do another uh, Bar Smarts Live class. That's a one day, nine hour, or 10 hour class. Uh, and then they have a five day certification that costs $5,000. That being said, I know some people who have done that five day certification program. It is definitely worth it if you can hack it or you can afford it. Uh, they all, they, a lot of times they will use that certification, like entrance to the certification program as a, um, as a prize for winning a cocktail uh, competition or something. Uh, but otherwise, any other type of certification I've never seen anyone have, any brand ambassador that I've ever worked with, any bartender that I've ever worked with, not many people have done that. I've done the Bar Smarts Wired. I really liked it. Um, I didn't really need it when I, like, when I did it. I did it and I was already eight years in. Now, a lot of the information that they were giving out, I already knew. 
but it is very, very, very good resource to have and it will definitely up your knowledge and it will show when you go to interviews. Um, so I, that's kind of a kind of a yes and kind of a no on both those things. But as far as bartending schools go, most of them are a complete waste of your time. Uh, they don't teach you drinks that are relevant. Uh, they don't use alcohol. A lot of them don't have uh, liquor licenses, so you're just using flavored water or you're using like colored water uh, to bartend with, and that doesn't teach you anything. They're just like follow these ratios. And then you'll make the drink. But if you can't taste through what you're doing, then you can't learn to shake properly. You can't learn to do any of that stuff. I really love the Tiki Cocktail series. Maybe you guys could go do a margarita series. Habanero, hibiscus, margarita, anyone? I mean, all of that sounds really good. But are there so many margaritas that there needs to be a series? I know that uh, Steve the bartender did like five or six margaritas in an episode once. Hi guys, I'm curious about the rhyme, uh, the rhyme that goes along the planter's punch. One of sour, two of sweet, three of strong, four of weak. But none of the actual recipes actually follow this ratio. Thoughts? Okay, because that ratio... Okay, that is a very old rhyme from the 1800s. And uh, if you re read David Wondrich's book, Punch, he kind of touches on it. If you read Imbibe, he also touches on it because he there's a couple of punch recipes in Imbibe as well. Uh, and basically, it did, that ratio just doesn't work much uh, very well. But that being said, that was the ratio that was used. That, that being said... Back then, spirits were made a different way. A lot of them were much higher proof than what we have available to us today, although we do have some pretty high proof spirits available. Um, and then most punches will have to be dialed in. So it is an antiquated rhyme to help jog somebody's memory on how to make a punch, but it's not really that relevant anymore, I would say. Most essential liqueurs and spirits for stocking your bar. Difference between gum and simple syrup. I am from Canada and bitter uh, and uh, bitter options are far and few between. Any comments on that? So if you don't know, how, here's the thing. If you don't know, can't find a certain bitters, make your own bitters. It's actually not that hard to do. And I will be doing a making your bitters uh, episode. The thing about making bitters is that there's two ways to do it. You can either do it you can do it the rapid way or you can do it the slow way. The slow way is how they used to do it where they macerate stuff for months at a time sometimes to get the proper maceration and then they that's how they make their bitters. Or you can actually do rapid method by using uh, immersion circulation and sous vide your ingredients for hours at a, at a specific temperature uh, and that will infuse things a little bit faster. Um, as far as... I'm going to go back up to that comment though. I lose it as far as there was a second part that I wanted to hold on Marius can you roll scroll down thing is, is that we're on a 30 second delay so anytime I say can you scroll down he I wanted to go back to that Canadian guy and uh, I just wanted to look at ways to improve during the lockdown bar smarts and keep watching you to learn thank you I appreciate that I want to see the 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 guy, the bitters guy from Canada. Leandro, remember to smile. Resting bitch face rules. <laughs> Actually, I have a really good example of turning someone around from a bad... This is going to go back to something we talked a long time ago about, but I have a really good story about this. So basically, I have a resting bitch face. It's true. Marius is constantly behind the camera telling me to smile all the time. He goes like this. Smile, smile, you need to smile more. The thing is, is that I have kind of a mean look when I'm just thinking or if I'm not, you know, actively trying to look like a pleasant person. Uh, I'm not mad ever. I'm not really in a bad mood. I'm a pretty generally happy person. Uh, and I, one day I was working at the bar and I was just like working on someone's cocktail and this guy was like, hey, can you make me an old fashioned? I'm like, yeah, sure, man. I'll just put it next to this other old fashioned that I'm making. Thanks for telling me. I'll just do it the, both at the same time. I'm making the old fashioned and then he, go, he leans across the bar and he goes, hey man, are you all right? And as soon as he said, hey man, are you all right? I knew that he was looking at my face. My face looked like I was in a bad mood. And so he was like reading my thing. And like he was also put off by it. I could just tell by his tone of voice that he was put off by it. So uh, I, said, uh, I said, yeah, but I suffer from, uh, 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 I, I suffer from uh, RDF. Thanks for bringing it up. He goes, what's RDF? I said, resting dick face, man. And he started laughing. And so that was like a good way of like taking someone who was like judging me and then also like 
kind of saying something in like a sort of an aggressive way and then like turning, putting them on the back foot and switching it around. And then we had a great conversation after that. All right. Difference between gum syrup and simple syrup. That's what I wanted to see. So that's what I had forgotten. Uh, so gum syrup is simple syrup with a little bit of gum arabic uh, added to it. Gum arabic is going to give it a very maple syrupy sort of texture. Uh, and it's a lot smoother in cocktails. It's a cocktail ingredient that was used a lot in the 1800s. We've kind of replaced it with just plain simple syrup. Uh, but the gum syrup will give your cocktails a silkier texture. Uh, and it is used. I mean, uh, the Death & Company guys use it in a Demerara. They do a Demerara gum syrup, which is really nice for a lot of cocktails. Uh, and it's really nice. Actually, I think I have some in the fridge. Let me see if I can find it. Hold on. Hold on, guys. Hold on. Right. So this is the Demerara gum syrup that I made uh, from the Death & Company specs. And as you can see, I don't know if you can see this, but as you can see, it's like... I said, I don't know if you can see this, but as you can see... I'm looking on the screen. You can definitely see it. It's like more of a maple syrup texture than most sugar is. Uh, it just kind of gives it like a little thicker quality and it gives it like a little bit of a, a silkier texture. It's a really nice ingredient. I highly recommend it. All right. What else we got here? Uh, any affordable replacements for recipes for Luxardo cherries? Yeah, there's a few. I mean, you can make your own basically or if you don't want to make your own, uh, you can um, you can get the Amarena cherries from Toshi, which is another Italian company that makes Amarena cherries. They're a bit um, a bit uh, uh, less expensive, but it, literally, if you go to Amazon and type in Luxardo cherries, it'll come up with like eight different alternatives from companies that are making pretty much the same cherries nowadays. So, really, you can. There's a whole bunch of options. So I'm gonna ask again, Sotol, and I'm gonna say again, uh, I don't know if I've actually tasted it. So I can't really speak to it. The question was simple syrup versus gum syrup. So like whether you should use simple syrup or gum syrup, you should use both simple syrup or gum syrup depending on what you're doing and depending on how you want your cocktail to come out. They're basically interchangeable. Simple, gum syrup is literally simple syrup with a little gum, a gum arabic included into it to give it that silkier texture. So you can use both. Uh, I tend not to use gum syrup that much, but I like it. It's a good ingredient. Is it going to be offensive if I order a proper martini in the middle of nowhere America? Vodka martini is assumed at most of the local bars. Oh, this is such a conundrum with the martini thing. Um, I would do this. Is this, this is not bad. I like this drink. Um, this is what I would do if I were you. I would create a rapport with the bartender. And then I'd, I'd say, hey, could you possibly make me this drink that I want? The thing is, is that you might be in a bar in the middle of middle America that might not have the ingredients to make a proper martini. For instance, they might be storing their dry vermouth on a shelf. And if they're doing that, don't have them make a martini because it's going to be disgusting because that vermouth should be in the fridge. So really, you sort of have to read your surroundings. There are some bars that you should just never order a martini in. And then you should just go to a bar that has martinis. Luckily for you, there are enough proper cocktail bars in the country at this point that you can order a martini somewhere in the middle of Mer in the middle of middle America. That's what I would say. All right, if you had to, who would you list as your top five or ten bartending YouTubers that we should all be subbed to, yourself included? Logan, are there ten bartenders on YouTube that you should be subbed to? I don't even know of that many. I mean, obviously, uh, I would say how to drink. Steve the bartender. Uh, Truffles on the Rocks is a great, great channel. And that guy is super knowledgeable and really fun. I like him. We did a little collaboration a while ago. I really like him. That's, that's what's that, three? Um, I'm not sure if there's, I mean, like, there's, like, Small Screen Network does some cool bartending stuff. Um, uh, Liquor.com does some cool bartending stuff. I shouldn't, you should look, look around, but honestly, I don't watch that many. And I'm not aware of that many, so... That's what I would say. What's a good use of Appleton Estate 12 year rum? Make a Mai Tai with it, man. Make a Mai Tai. Appleton Estate 12 is awesome. I love it. Cocktail chemistry. How could we forget Nick? I even mentioned him in this. Cocktail chemistry, of course. So that's four. Uh, definitely cocktail chemistry. He makes a really, he's got a great channel too. And I, I watch a lot of those videos as myself because they're awesome. Uh, and I love Nick. Nick is a great guy. So definitely cocktail chemistry. Uh, Distinguished Spirits is a very underrated channel. That's another one 
that I watched uh, quite a bit of. I haven't watched it in a while, but Distinguished Spirits is another good one. So thank you, Chris Twiggs. He does a lot of Tiki stuff. Uh, I really like his format. Um, very underrated, man. That guy should have more subs. I, I don't I have any idea why he doesn't have more subs. It might just be because he doesn't post that much, but he's got a great channel, so you should definitely check it out. So that's five top ones for sure, and that's not including myself. So maybe six. What do you do with the leftover egg yolks after using egg whites for cocktails? Uh, well, I should make like a little egg yolk omelet for my dog or for myself. Uh, but sometimes I just toss them out, which is bad. I should find a more sustainable use for it, for sure. I, I need another drink. So, excuse me, guys. Ooh. I want to try this Junipero in a... I, I got this really nice, lightly, light, lightly refreshing, refreshingly light cucumber tonic water that I think is gonna go really good with this, but I wanna taste this on its own first. So, if you don't mind, guys, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna want to rinse this out. There's still a little blue curacao on this. If you don't mind, I'm gonna drink out of my jigger. Oh, that's nice. Oh, nicely, really botanical. Oh, that's good. I like that. It's really nice. Nice and juniper but it's got some nice berries, cinnamon, um, angelica. It's a nice gin. I'm going to do a full two ounces of that gin. If I don't mind, is there a beginner budget-friendly cocktail book that you would recommend? Uh, I think, can you describe what budget-friendly means? I mean, I know it means a cheap cocktail book, but I can't think of any cocktail books that are... I can't think of any cocktail books that are that are more expensive than, you know, I don't know, 20 bucks off the top of my head. I mean, probably PDT cocktail books is a good one to start with. Um, Nightcap is another one that I really liked a lot. Uh, there's a, the Martini Cocktail by Robert Simonson is really good. Robert Simonson has one called Three Ingredient Cocktails, which actually... I think you should get Robert Simonson's Three Ingredient Cocktails. That's a wonderful book to start with. Ooh, yeah. I'm gonna put the rest of this in the fridge. Why waste ice? All right. Once a portion of orange has been peeled, do you have a peel? Do you have to peel the rest of that day? Uh, I mean, here's the deal. If you don't use that orange in good time, it is going to, it is going to uh, rot pretty quickly. So I would either peel the rest of it or just cut it and juice it and drink some orange juice or use some, uh, find some use for the juice. Crafted Tanqueray Gin Martini Style Drink with Dry Vermouth and Green Chartreuse. Does that drink already exist? Also, what gin would you use? So Crafted well, didn't you just say Tanqueray Gin Martini style with dry vermouth, green chartreuse? It sounds close to a Tipperary, but I'm not sure if that exact thing, I would dial that down to two ounces, not 2.5. Uh, green chartreuse, if you wanna do something well with green chartreuse, I would pick a gin with a lot of really uh, big botanicals like this Junipero is really, really nice from San Francisco. Oh, it goes good in this cucumber tonic too. Oh yes, I love it. Uh, hi, Leandro. Have you had an experience using, I can't even pronounce that, Zatabentuin? No, I have not had any experience with it at all. Um, nope. Don't know what it is. What is it? Now you have to tell me what it is. I want a rematch between you and Greg's martinis. Did we, were we competing? I don't think we were competing. Were we competing? You know, Mr. Tolmac, he is really someone you should check out. I've seen his channel before, but I actually haven't really watched very much of it, but I'm aware of who he is. Uh, Mr. Tolmac, that is. Uh, what was that super chat, Marius? Go back to the super chat. Can you suggest a cocktail that uses sake or sochu? I have a sake cocktail video coming out, so why would I spoil it? It's called A Little Tokyo, and it is phenomenally good. If you ever come to Tennessee, you need to check out Old Dominic Distillery in Memphis. Great bourbon. 
vodka and just put out a gin and just put out a gin. Nice. I definitely will. Uh, I went to Tennessee last year and I went uh, to the uncle nearest distillery and we looked at Jack Daniels from afar and we had some really great, uh, we went to Lynchburg and had a really great lunch um, at uh, Miss Mary Bobo's and we had a little, I went to uh, uh, Attaboy in East Nashville and had a few drinks and it was awesome. Uh, once I tried to order, any recommendations on liqueur, uh, liqueur brands? The main brands I see are Bowles, De Kuyper, and Giffard's. It depends on what liqueur you're using. I like Giffard a lot. Bowles for some things, but not all things. Uh, also, um, I'm not sure where you're based, but Tempest Fugit makes some really good liqueurs as well. So like Creme de Menthe, uh, Creme de Coco. Uh, what else do they make? They make a Grand Classico Aperitivo, which is really nice. Once I tried to order a Kuiperini in the middle of Telluride, Colorado, the bartender looked at me like I am an alien. Well, I gotta tell, I gotta say, guys. Uh, okay, here we go. Is that Tambutuan is a Yucatan anise honey liqueur? I want to try it. Where can I find it? I've got um, now. I want to have to. I, I, that sounds really awesome. I gotta try that. But I have. I don't have any experience with it at all. So. Uh, De Kuiper doesn't use high fructose corn syrup, if you care. I do care. I hate high fructose corn syrup. Um, have you ever had, have you ever had a fan to try to mail you a bottle? Yes, I've had several fans mail me bottles. And I am, as soon as this coronavirus things is over, I will have, be actually releasing episodes with cocktails that they sent me to utilize in the bottles that they sent me. So, I can't wait. But yeah, they have sent me bottles before. And it's awesome. I love it when people do that. And, you know, if you have a bottle to send, send it on down. What is the difference between creme de coco white and creme de coco dark besides the color? Uh, good question. Uh, the color, uh, for the most part, is the, is the, is the, uh, the difference. Have you ever made a June bug? It's a popular cocktail in Korea. Never have. What is the cocktail? Do you know what the specs are? Ever work with hibiscus syrup? Yes. Actually, we did a, uh, a no egg sours episode where we, and we did a hibiscus syrup in that cocktail, gin hibiscus sour, basically. I think that's actually what it's called, gin hibiscus sour. It was really good. I personally like the herbal notes of gin. Silver tequila is also interesting. Sweet and spicy. Rum is third, the sweet, but it's not deep in flavor. Uh, rum has a lot of different variation there, buddy. And a lot of them are very deep in flavor and just really depends on what rum you're drinking. Uh, are there many... Wait, what drinks use creme de cassis? Uh, creme de cassis, which is black currant liqueur. Uh, a traditional, off the top of my head, a traditional tequila sunrise has creme de cassis. There are a few others that I have encountered over the years. It's not an ingredient I use very often, but uh, the original Tequila Sunrise, which we do have a video for, uh, uses that creme de cassis. Are there any other options besides Jennifer Bowles for Jennifer? Yeah, there are a million different options. There's, Jennifer is a, a very, very popular category. Uh, there are a few. Uh, there's a guy named Philip Duff who makes his own, and uh, you should check it out. But yeah, there's a lot of different Jennifers out there. Uh, Bowles is not actually... You know, bowls is something that I use a lot because I have a bottle on hand, but um, I wouldn't say that it would be like my go-to bottle. Do you think lime is optional in gin and tonic? I feel that lime and peel juice is important for the flavor profile. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I am not drinking it with lime right now. I have a lime right here I could very easily cut and use for my gin and tonic. I do like the tartness of lime juice um, in a gin and tonic, but I do not think that it is a must. I think that it is pleasant but I don't think that you have to because the point of the gin and tonic is the tonic and the gin mesh together. Uh, Leandro, why is gin your liqueur of choice instead of deep dark rum flavors or woody tequila? Actually, gin is not my, is not my, my liquor of choice really. Whiskey is what I normally go to, uh, but I just love the delicate nature of gin. I love the complexity of full play a large part in the way that it tastes. And so there's a lot of, um, Maris is calling me again. There's a lot of variance in the way that bourbon tastes or like American whiskey, any barrel aged thing. 
But gin is a proprietary blend of spices every time. So they're all different. What's up? Oh, that's so weird. I wonder what happened. Oh, okay. Well, it's back now, so bye. Mary has called me to tell me that the sound dropped out, and then it, it came back for some reason. I don't know what happened there. Uh, I mean, I don't know. My, my, my lab is, it is where it was always, so I don't know. All right, uh, what are we doing? Here we go. Uh, could you give me the, wait, I didn't get that. This chat goes fast sometimes. What can I make with Batavia Iraq? Ooh, what can I make with Batavia Iraq? We're going to have a Batavia Iraq episode come out with cocktails and history. Uh, I'm not going to tell you now. I'm going to tell you then. Just made a maple leaf with my Crown Royal. That's one. That's tasty. Any suggestions for improving the standard recipe? I don't know what a maple leaf is. I've got to look at the, um, got to look at the specs and then I can taste it and then I'll tell you. I can't just look at something and say this is how you improve it i always need to taste it and need to know what it is every time thank you for getting a big passion for me uh contemplated for years if i should invest into mixology you convinced me also appreciate the feedback on drinks on instagram keep up the great work well hey thank you so much i really appreciate that i really appreciate that i could be a part of your development and i'll uh, help you along with your your passion you know we should all be, here's the thing guys, life is too short. We're in a time now where there is a virus going around killing people. We should just be doing what we want to do and, 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 and we, should be, we should be chasing our passions, right? That's what life is about. All right, what kind of tasty beer-based cocktails are there out there? There's a billion. I cannot just answer that question by saying, oh, there's just this one beer-based cocktail you should drink. There are a lot of really beer-based cocktails out there. We have a playlist on beer cocktails. Click on that, and that'll get you started. Um, but there are a lot of them out there. And it just depends on what kind of beer you're going to use. I mean, that plays a big part in it, you know? I soaked some habaneros in vodka recently to tone down their heat in a dish, and now I have a bunch of very good but very spicy vodka. Any advice on what to use it in? Very spicy vodka. I would make some... You could do a margarita. Sub out half an ounce of the tequila for half an ounce of your spiced vodka and or a quarter ounce of the spiced vodka, depending on how spicy you want it. And you can make some spicy margaritas for sure. Uh, yeah, that's what I would do with it. I don't know. Uh, I would make some spicy ass cocktails. Make some spicy, uh, make habanero spiced lemon drops. Do that. That's really good. Three quarters of an ounce. Of, this is what you should do. This is what you do. You do three quarters of an ounce of uh, your lemon juice, three quarters of an ounce simple syrup, half an ounce of dry curacao, and one and a half ounces of spicy uh, vodka. Rim a glass with sugar, shake, strain into a chilled coupe, uh, lemon twist. Sorry, my translator wasn't activated. Do you know any good seasoning for salmon? Seasoning for salmon? Like you're cooking salmon and now we're going to season it? Steve, the bartender, made a vid about spicy margaritas. Yes, he did. If I am going to make my own sweet vermouth, can I fortify it with vodka? Yes, you can. You should. Probably about an ounce of vodka. Um, the thing about sweet vermouth is that it is fortified wine, so usually there's a measure of brandy in sweet vermouth. Not always, but usually there is. So uh, why don't you just fortify it with brandy, and then you can make sure, because it's, you know, Sweet vermouth is fortified wine, so fortify it with brandy. But yes, you can fortify it. Uh, mate, know of any cocktails with for sweet tooths? Here's the thing. I don't really do overly sweet cocktails. I really like to try and balance those sweet and tart flavors most of the time. Um, that being said, the white Russian that I have up is pretty gosh darn sweet. So maybe... Uh, any favorite sherry-based cocktails using Pedro Jimenez sherry, which is that nice raisiny? Uh, I was using that last winter uh, quite a bit. Uh, off the top of my head, just to give you specs right now, I don't know if I have anything with Pedro Jimenez just off the top of my head. Uh, but there are a few. 
Um, you, I think we have a Sherry playlist, but if we're not, just email me, theeducatedbarfly at gmail.com. Uh, I'll pull out some of my recipes for you so that you have some recipes to do with your uh, PX Sherry. What do we got? What else? When the plaque lifts, you should go to try Compass Buck Great King Scott Glasgow Blend. I have some, uh, I have some uh, Compass Box, but not the Great King, uh, the Great King Street. But I have tasted it, and it is good. Do you think Pappy is overrated? Ugh. Here's we're going to go. You know, here's the thing. I was actually going to do, I, I am, not I was, I am going to do a, a video uh, that's going to utilize a little bit of Pappy and some Old Weller. And we're going to kind of go through this sort of how to make a poor man's Pappy. But I am not partial to weeded bourbon. For me, it's too sweet. I do think that... here it's. It's like, Pappy Van Winkle is a unicorn bottle because it is rare, not because it is so amazing that uh, you uh, will never find another bottle of it. The thing is, is that it's rarity breeds price. Rarity determines the price. It determines uh, how, uh, how ravenous people are for that particular bottle. But it is, you know, bottles of whiskey are, you know, sort of... Everything flavor is subjective, and 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 bottles of whiskey are really up to whoever it is that's drinking them. So I know people who hate Pappy Van Winkle. I know people who love Pappy Van Winkle. Everybody wants it because nobody has it because it's rare, and so the price goes up, and so it's sort of like a unicorn bottle that everyone wants to see around. Um, that being said, I like Pappy Van Winkle. It's good whiskey, but it's not what I would normally choose. I like a high rye mash bill. I like something that has a bit of rye in it. So if you don't know anything about weeded bourbon, right, which Maker's Mark is one of, Old Weller, Pappy, uh, is that they replace the rye, the usual rye in the mash bill with wheat. And so what they say is that it has a sweeter, smoother flavor. But for me, I like that rye bite. For me, it kind of balances out the sweetness of the, the bourbon. And so... You have a, you know, a kind of a balance in flavor. So I wouldn't say that it's overrated, but it's definitely something that uh, I don't prefer weeded bourbons in general. Um, you know, that said, you know, like, just like wine, rarity breeds uh, price. So it's going to be a very expensive bottle and it's going to be a very sought after bottle just because it's, there's just not a lot of it. Logan, favorite inexpensive but palatable shots to make in bulk. Talking like 50 plus people at a time, served quickly, frat and sorority parties coming up. Uh, my favorite charts, like a like a like a a Ferrari, right? Which is half Frenette, half Campari. Don't judge it till you try it. Uh, what else do we got? I really like uh, a um, good night and good luck, which is three quarters of a shot of uh, Ray and Nephew overproof with uh, just a topper, a little, little topper, a little quarter ounce topper of uh, green chartreuse. It's called a good night and good luck. Uh, that's not inexpensive though. So favorite inexpensive but palatable shots. Uh, how about just uh, shots of rye whiskey? Uh, that's inexpensive and palatable. What are your three favorite cocktails? I don't have three favorite cocktails. That's why I have this channel because I have hundreds of favorite cocktails. Uh, but I do prefer uh, aromatic whiskey drinks like Old Fashioned's Manhattan's and Sazerac's. Um, I don't tend to go towards citrusy drinks that much. So there you have it. What do we got? I agree. Not the time for parties. I really want to go, but it's not the time. Yeah. Five drinks you'd put up. You'd put on a home bar menu, and general home bar advice. Uh, Home bar advice. That's something that I could do 5, 10, 15 videos on. There's a lot of different things about uh, having a home bar. The question is, are we having a home bar for your own enjoyment or having a home bar for uh, like entertaining? The question is, as far as like a menu, are we doing this for a party? Because I have very strict rules for party menus. So for instance, when I do a party, I like to limit the cocktail menu because it can become very expensive very quickly. So uh, I usually like to do uh, old fashions for sure, always, because everyone's going to ask for it. It's one of the most popular drinks. 
any kind of manly sort of drink or men that are around are going to want to drink an old-fashioned at some point. I like to do one old-fashioned variation, like an American trilogy uh, or something that I've concocted on my own that will sort of be like the wow factor. So you have your regular old-fashioned, then hey, I got something that you should try. I made this old-fashioned variation I think you'll really like. Boom. And then you get that in for the wow factor. Obviously, you're going to have a citrus cocktail that's going to appeal to very wide variety of people. So I usually go for an east side there. Um, I usually do a rye buck. So this is for people who think they don't like to drink whiskey. I like to prove them wrong with the rye buck, which is uh, lime, ginger syrup, rye whiskey, ice and, gin, and, and, and soda water. So I'll do something like that. And then sometimes I'll make like a French 75 punch. So I'll do like a little bit of orange bitters, uh, lemon, uh, simple syrup, gin, ice, and then top it off with champagne. And that's just like the starter for the party. Uh, but that's just general, general, general advice very quickly. Uh, this is something that I should cover in some videos because uh, entertaining parties is, there's a lot of problems that you run into depending on where you're entertaining your people. Uh, and it has to do with the amount of the ingredients you have, how you're gonna refrigerate your ice. There's like a whole bunch of things when you're doing what I call off-site events, which is off-site from a bar where you have all the equipment that you need in one place. Uh, I will be doing some videos on it for sure. Ah, what else? Uh, well, what is your least favorite cocktail? My least favorite cocktail is called a horse's jizz. That's my least favorite cocktail. Uh, please do a home bar video soon. And can you make a drink or a sipper of your most prized booze? Oh, I almost did it today. Darren, you're reading my mind. I almost did it today. If I had had soda water, I was going to take out my bottle. I have a $100 bottle of scotch that I made into a highball and I got so much criticism for it. And all the people that were criticizing me were completely wrong about what they were criticizing me about. And so I was going to do it again. So I have this uh, bottle of Springbank Spring 12-year scotch. It's uh, about a $90 bottle. Uh, I like to make highballs with it. And I was going to do that tonight, but I didn't have any soda water, so I just switched to gin. Thoughts on the pickleback? I love a pickleback, as long as it's quality pickle juice. So at Kohl's, Kohl's makes their own pickle juice, and it's got habanero and jalapeno in the brine, and so it's a spicy pickle juice. So I have two different shot combinations that I like to do. The pickleback, which is good. I've been doing those shots for 10 years. It's fine. I love them. And then I have what's called a liquid dip. A liquid dip is a shot of rye whiskey and a shot of au jus, right, which is the spiced beef broth that we do, and then a shot of pickle juice at the end. Uh, if you do, if you get rid of the pickle juice, then we just call that a beef on rye shot, and it's my favorite thing to do ever. It is so phenomenally good. Maybe when I do a shots episode, if I ever do a shots episode, I will show you that shot, because it is amazing. Serious Eats did an experiment on supremely fast glasses chilling. They used vodka in the freezer to chill the glass in under 60 seconds. What is your thought on that? I don't have any thoughts on it, my friend, because I've never tried it, so I don't really know much about it. Oh my God, I want a pickle, yeah. With Cole's hot mustard. <sighs> Elliot, you are insane. You're an insane person. Hot mustard shot cocktail? We'd have to do that with gin or vodka or something. That's crazy. Any thoughts on using strictly aromatic ingredients like rose water? I really like, I like rose water in certain cocktails, it depends. Haha, <laughs> pickled egg, no. No pickled eggs in cocktails unless you're doing a Bloody Mary. Now you're talking crazy talk, Elliot. Why did you become a bartender? Uh, you, honestly, Lucas, you know why I became a bartender? Because I was an actor and I needed a job that I could work at night and keep my days free for auditioning. That's the original reason I became a bartender. My reason evolved over time. Can you talk about Campbelltown Scotch whiskeys and how they differ from other Scotch whiskeys? Uh, I personally love Glen Scotia. I have a 10-year peated port cask that is amazing and 15-year rum cask. I'd love to talk about that, but I am not a Scotch authority. I like Scotch. I know a bit about it. The Campbelltown Scotches are really awesome, like Long Row and, like Long Row and, uh, and uh, Springbank, but uh, I don't want to speak too... Uh, I don't want to speak 
with authority on something that I'm not an authority on. You, Greg, Steve, helped me start up my game big time. Thanks. Aside from enjoying responsi responsibly, which you should always enjoy responsibly, by the way, guys. Uh, how do you or other bartenders take care of your health, RE, alcohol consumption, uh, caloric intake, liver health, etc.? Well, um, there's a lot of things that I do. I exercise quite a bit. Uh, I make sure that I get enough sleep. Uh, that is also something that I do for my health. Uh, I eat very well. Uh, my wife likes to give me lots of homeopathic remedies that she's into, which I think are helping me for sure. And uh, as far as liver health goes, like, I mean, you just take a lot. You, there are a lot of vitamins and things that you can do for yourself. Uh, I'm going to put this over here. Um, but you got to really, the main things that are eating well, making sure that you're getting enough sleep, all right, and making sure that, you're, that you are, like, eating well, making sure that you get enough sleep, make sure you're getting all the nutrients, making sure that you're taking your vitamin, like, enough vitamins once a day and stuff to keep yourself healthy. That's how I do it. Do you think if I sub out maraschino liqueur with elderflower in an aviation, it would work? Uh, I think it would probably work, but here's the thing about maraschino. Maraschino is really dry on the finish. Elderflower is really sweet on the finish. So what you're going to have is something that's less dry and more sweet. Chris Twiggs, what do we got? Hitting 1130 here in Florida, so I need to head to bed. But first, I have to remind you and Marius how much we appreciate you guys. Hey, Chris, thank you so much. I appreciate you very much as well. And I appreciate all of you guys. So thanks for tuning in. It is, is it really 9.30, 8.30, 8, 9, 10, 11? Yeah, so, you know, at East Coast time, it's 11.30. Um, I'm usually in bed by 9, 10 o'clock, so I hear you on the uh, going to sleep early biz. Do you have a chance to visit Death & Company in L.A.? I have not had a chance to get to L.A. Death & Company yet. I plan to. Uh, I have been planning to, but uh, I haven't gotten there, and then coronavirus hit. So when that is done and everyone's back in business, I will definitely go there. What's the best way to prep your coffee for espresso martini if you don't have a machine? I like to use these guys. Here, I'll show you. I like to use one of these guys. I got a lot of flack for it, but it makes a great espresso martini. I don't know how it got so melted, but uh, one of these Bialetti Mocha Expresses right here. You can use espresso grind in this. Uh, you don't get the crema from the espresso, but it, I said espresso, but I meant to say espresso. Um, so you don't get the crema from the espresso, so a lot of espresso people are like, oh, it's not espresso. But here's the thing. You get the crema from the espresso, then you put it in a shaker and you shake it. Does it really matter? Do you really know the difference? No, I don't think you do. So uh, so uh, I like to use a, a Bialetti... Uh, uh, Mocha Express for my uh, espresso martinis uh, because I actually do not have an espresso maker here in the house. Uh, you, what else? What else do we got? What else do we got? What other questions do we got, my friends? Aeropress is great espresso alternative. There you go. So there you go, Aeropress. I've heard good things about it. Haven't used one myself, but. Uh, is there a resource on cocktail pairing for food dishes? like how they are wine pairing for food. Honestly, I would tell you that the, there's two just, just flavor pairing books that I use, which are the Flavor Bible and then Flavor Matrix. Both of those are just talking about sort of the science of flavor and what goes with what. And flavor pairing, whether it's cocktails and food or just like ingredients and cocktails or ingredients and food, kind of all fits in the same realm. So those are my two resources for flavor pairing that I use. Uh, you were across. You were at a bar across the street from the bar I work at in. Wait, what? In Palm Springs, and I didn't realize until the next day. Broke the. Wait, you were at a bar across the street from the bar I work in in Palm Springs, and I didn't realize until the next day. Broke my heart. Ha ha ha. When was I in a bar? The old last bar that I was in in Palm Springs was a long time ago. When was this, Alex Bravo? By the way, you have a great action figure name or maybe even porn star name. I love it, Alex Bravo. That's amazing. It's like you're an action hero, kind of. Uh, do you know any good websites for cocktail recipes? I like Dipper's Guide a lot, but they have... Uh, a lot because they have a great advanced search option. Yeah, Difference Guide. The thing about Difference Guide and Difference Guide is a great 
is a great resource. Uh, their specs, though, on certain cocktails, I'm sort of not in agreement with, just FYI. But they are a good resource. What's your opinion of roses syrups? Grenadine. Greg is a vehement hater. I am also a vehement hater of roses. Uh, so from what I understand, back in the day, back when roses was first created, it was created with actual, you know, kind of sugar syrup, you know, lime cordial. Uh, but nowadays it's made with high fructose corn syrup and I hate it. It's horrible, terrible. Don't use any of those syrups. Love your episodes with the other bartenders. When will you do one with cocktail chemistry and how to drink at the same time? Well, here's the deal. Cocktail chemistry is in San Francisco and how to drink is in New York. So doing them at the same time would be weird and hard unless we were doing it via Skype or something. But I would love to do something with both of them at the same time. Um, I definitely have plans to go back up to San Francisco and when we're up there, I really hope that Nick will shoot with us again because I had a really great time the last time that we met. Uh, so we had a really good afternoon shooting a bunch of content together um, in Nick's apartment and it was a lot of fun. So hopefully when we go to San Francisco next, we will meet up with Nick and maybe we'll go do some stuff. Most of that content will probably go to our Freeport channel, which is the kind of more experimental channel that we're doing right now. So if you're not subbed to Barfly Free Pour, go to youtube.com backslash Barfly Free Pour and sub it. Uh, did you watch this? Uh, I don't know what that is because I cannot click the link. I mean, I could click the link, I guess, but then I would, I would anger Marius, I think. Educated Barfly Cocktail Parent, how to drink. The Holy Trinity of Cocktail YouTube Channels. Madness! It would be amazing if we did a episode together. I don't know how we would, but it would be amazing. Do you drink at home? And has any of the viewers' cocktails made it into your favorites? Uh, honestly, the view I am so impressed by the quality of the viewer submissions that there are a few that I really love a lot. Um, I don't drink cocktails at home that much. Uh, but when I do, um, yeah, I mean, I'll make like whatever's kind of on my mind, I guess. Uh, the cocktails from the viewer created cocktails though, I got to say that series has been a wild, has been wildly successful in my opinion. Uh, do you drink at home? No, we are. Okay. Actually. Okay. So I'm trying this Dr. Bird Jamaica rum. Oh, love it with triple sec lime juice and an invert simple syrup. It leaves an aftertaste similar to the aftertaste from smoking a cigar. Any idea why? Ah, I'd have to taste all those ingredients together to figure it out. The spring swing was amazing. Props to the guy that submitted that. Yeah, that was a good one. And that was like one of the first. So props to you for remembering that one. That was great. Difference Guys is grats for use in-house or at work. Yeah, I mean, Difference Guide is a great, it's a, it's a great resource. It really is. Progression path for making cocktails at home, starting from nothing, what to buy first, etc. Have friends interested in making their own drinks, but don't have anything on hand. You know, here's the thing about making drinks at home, especially when you don't know where to start. You have to have, you, everything that you do when it's like building a home bar or creating your own thing is really, you got to identify for yourself like what, what the end result of your home bar is going to be. Like for instance, if you want to taste scotch, you're not going to go get a whole bunch of cocktail stuff because, you know, you just want to taste scotch. So you're going to want to, you know, kind of build your home bar for the scotch taster. Same thing goes for cocktails. Like what kind of cocktails do you want to make? You sort of have to define this for yourself to be able to know where to start first. I will start doing a few building your home bar videos though um, when me and Mary's can get together and shoot when this coronavirus thing is done. And we will, uh, like, I'll, I'd love to figure that out for everybody. Uh, what is your favorite smelling spirit liqueur? Gin, hands down. Uh, and some rum. Any thoughts on jasmine liqueur? Uh, nope, because I haven't really tried any specific ones. Um, I've done some jasmine syrups and I like jasmine and stuff. It's good. Dep as long as you pair the flavor. Here's the thing. This is what I'm going to say. A lot of people say, what's your opinion on this liqueur or that liqueur? And it's like this. A, if I haven't tried it, I don't have an opinion. But I will say that I like most ingredients as long as they're paired properly with the right, in, like the right ingredients. As long as you pair your ingredients and your flavors properly, then a lot of different things can be good. There are certain things that I don't stand behind, like things that use artificial sweeteners or any type of artificial, artificial 
kind of chemicals I'm not really into. Some people say like, oh, you rail about chemicals, but then you use citric acid. And it's yes, but it's, yes, that citric acid is naturally derived. So yes, it's technically a chemical. And yes, technically everything are chemicals in the world. But you know what I'm talking about when I say like chemical additives into spirits are not my favorites. Ha, have you chosen a rum? Origin for cachaça to agriculture to Cuba and to Guatemala. I wouldn't say cachaça is rum, but okay. Uh, only one to have available for the rest of your life. Which one would you pick? I would pick, um, I would pick, pick, uh, oh man, probably Jamaican rum. Probably Jamaican rum, I would say. If I could pick only one, or rum agricole, rum agricole, Jamaican rum. I don't know. I don't know. Why are you making me pick anything from Hampton Estates? Or rum agricole. Yes, uh, yes. I haven't tasted the green bar uh, jasmine liqueur, but I'm sure it's great. I like jasmine and stuff. Have you ever tasted NOS No Ordinary Spirit? I have not tasted it. Uh, but underlying honey seems they could vary. Wait, looking for cocktails to make using Fernet Branca. Why haven't you done the hanky panky? I have done the hanky panky. Absolutely, one hundred percent have done the hanky panky. Why don't you type in to go to YouTube and type into search? Well, you're already on YouTube, but uh, go into search and type in hanky panky barfly. I guarantee you, we have done it. What do I like to drink straight up? I like to drink whiskey straight up. Um, I like to drink some brandy straight up or uh, cognac. Early in the morning. All right. Horror Beauty FX. See you later. Thanks for stopping by. Really appreciate it. Well, do you guys always finish the drink you make on the show? Mm. What do you think? Do we always finish the drink we make on the show? What do you think? Almost 6 a.m., boys. Have a good night. All right. See you later. Thank you for stopping by and sticking with us for so long. Really appreciate it. I don't know. Is it time to wrap up the stream? I mean, I'm having fun here talking to you guys. We haven't done the hanky panky. Are you sure, Marys, that we haven't done the hanky panky? I, I kind of want to go look. Am I going to prove you guys wrong right now? I don't know. Let's see. Let's check it out. You're right, we haven't done the hanky panky. Well, we shall have to we shall have to do a hanky panky episode. I was I, I I mean we probably haven't done it to date because I thought we did it already. I mean it's it's hard to keep up with how uh, however many cocktails we've done. We've done like 460 episodes or some somewhere around there. So, it's a little bit difficult to keep up with every single episode we've done. Wow, I'm really surprised that we haven't done the hanky panky. Super chat, you need to finish the super chat cocktail. I already did it. What are you talking about? Really? Seriously? You want this is diluted ice. That was ice, Evan. Literally. That was ice. That was ice flavored with a tiny bit of the flavors. Uh, what good what is good brandy? I did a cold brew cocktail and I felt the brandy was lost. Not sure. Uh, you know, honestly, I really like Argonaut brandy. It's one of my favorite brands. If you're here in California, you can find them. Um, I'm not sure exactly where where they are distributed. Um, they're obviously, I think they're in New York as well on the East Coast. They're mainly California in the East Coast as well, but they do three different expressions. Um, well, actually, the third expression is just for bars. So they do like a saloon strength for bars. Then they have one called Speculator and Fat Thumb. Um, one's a little bit robust than the other. One's the other one's a little smoother. Uh, what I really like about uh, their brandy is that they have a chart on the back that shows you all the grape varietals that went into making the brandy. It's really great stuff. Um, so you should check them out for sure and see if your brandy cocktail will fare a little bit better. Sun Yun, there's lots of Japanese whiskey bars in LA. Yeah. Okay, the drink at the beginning is a ginger sea. Thank you, Casey Jenkins. A ginger sea. I liked it. It was good. It was, it was pretty good. Yeah, I like it. 
The Ginger Sea, thank you so much. Yeah, liquor shelf collection would be cool to see. Yeah, Thalboro is great cocktail with scotch and honey and cream top. Yes, it is. Wonderful. You can get Argonaut Brandy in Chicagoland at Blinies, which is... Yeah, there you go. So it's in some major cities, but not a ton. It's not everywhere. It's not in the middle of the country yet, I don't think. What are the best cocktail books out there? Oh, there's so many really good ones. Um, I mean, you want to check out... Depending on if you're a beginner or not a beginner, you want to check out... Uh, Definitely, you want to check out Cocktail Codex by the Death & Company guys and the Death & Company's first book. You want to check that out as well. Uh, you definitely want to check out uh, Flavor Bible, Flavor Matrix, which aren't cocktail books, but you will definitely use them a ton. If you're creating cocktails, you want to check out um, uh, Liquid Intelligence. You definitely want to check out Imbibe and Punch by David Wondrich. These are like the starter cocktail books. Thoughts on adding fresh nutmeg as a garnish? I see high-end bars at it in every single cocktail without discretion. I think that they go really well in holiday-themed cocktails, and there are a, and they go well in there are a bunch of cocktails they go well in. I don't I don't think they go well in every cocktail. Uh, you shouldn't just be c putting nutmeg on everything. Uh, what do you think about doing drinks from different countries? I love doing drink drinks from different countries. If I have the specs for them and I think they're a good drink, I will do a drink from anywhere. Uh, I mean, I think we're talking about the uh, passion fruit liqueur. Uh, your uh, and for that, you want to do a uh, porn star martinis are like the main one. But uh, anything that needs a little passion fruit, my friend, something with it tomorrow night. Make a make a porn star martini. We have a we have a. Uh, we have an episode on it. Have you tried Inferno Bitter? I have not tried. What do you have to say about beer cocktails and or wine cocktails? I, I like them both. I mean, honestly, any cocktail made with any ingredient I'm going to like as long as the ingredients are paired properly. You know, uh, the wine cocktail, I actually uh, suggested a wine cocktail today. Uh, beer cocktails, I didn't suggest one specific one, but there are a lot of really great ones out there. It's just about doing the research. We have a playlist on all of this stuff, I'm pretty sure. So check us out. Uh, you have a great drink channel. I learned a lot from you. Hey, thank you, Wanderson. I appreciate that. What else? Marius is talking about smoking fish with people. Marius is about to type something in the notepad. We're... Nope over two hours. Wow, that flew by, guys. All right, well, I think we're gonna have to wrap up our live stream tonight. Uh, this is how I think the live streams are gonna go from now on. We're gonna do two hour live streams once a week uh, because A, I don't want you guys to get bored of live streams, but B, we've gotta think of fun things to do on the live streams instead of just sitting here like this and hanging out with you guys. But I love hanging out with you guys, and the time goes by super fast. So, yeah, I don't know. I think that's what we're going to do. I'm going to drink this ginger beer while I talk to you guys. Um, Two-hour live streams once a week, every Monday, 7 p.m., unless otherwise noted. If you guys want to um, get the news on whatever live streams that we've got going on, I'm going to post them in the community tabs on Educated Barfly and Barfly Free Pour. And I'll post a story about it on uh, Instagram. Uh, so we're going to wrap this up. Uh, I hope you guys have a great night. Love you guys so much. Thank you, Alex Bravo, for that super chat. Uh, I will see you guys on another time. And uh, I will leave it to Marius to maybe uh, put up the holding screen and take us out with music if he wants to. I don't know. Let's see what he does at the end here. I'm just going to drink this ginger beer. Oh, and go buy some t-shirts at Teespring. They're really awesome. We got some new designs up. Some really good new designs. And thank you, Evan. Really appreciate it. Like and subscribe, Teespring. Do all that good stuff if you can. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you guys next Monday.